question. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to come and, and play around for a little bit. Um, first of all, I'm really sorry to put you through that. I didn't pick the name. Um, kind of <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you. I, calm down. Got to calm myself down. <laughs> I am so excited any time there's a teaching and learning situation. So I have had no caffeine yet today because that would have been really dangerous. Um, but the concept of bringing really educated people together to kind of play around in teaching learning situation is just always an exciting thing. So I'm going to try to do three or four things really quickly at the beginning to get things rolling. Number one, Stephen Brookfield. I don't know how many of you have heard of Stephen Brookfield, but he's a really neat guy who's written a bunch of stuff on reflection. He's, and he said, it's very rare for a faculty member to have the opportunity to be in the seat of a student. You can empathize with students, but to feel what it's like to be a student is a rare opportunity. So I would encourage you to embrace that today. Today you will be like a student, you'll have faculty members, and you'll go to different sessions like different classes, and you can look through what works, what doesn't work, what do you like, what do you not care for, and take notes on that. So the process is a really neat thing too. So just, I think, embrace this concept here today. Number two is my friend Tom Angelo, and Tom Angelo has written uh, classroom assessment techniques and done some bunch of stuff. Tom has got one of my favorite quotes of all time. Was, Teaching without learning is just talking. <laughs> so the concept of probably thinking or of thinking about teaching and learning and, and what's happening is I think a really important thing. So those are the two big people out there. And then next one, I just have to introduce a couple of quick things about myself. Number one is I am a first generation college student. Um, I, some of you may have heard this story, but i got to just say, because I think it really helps out with the whole concept. I talk to student groups a lot, talk to a lot of different faculty, but when I started college, I was going to be a state trooper, and I'm watching the clock here too, so I'm going to do this really, really quickly here. I was going to be a Michigan state trooper, so I went over to the Michigan state trooper post, and I said, what do I have to do to be a state cop? That's what I want to do. He says, well, you're, how old are you? And I said, I'm 17, almost 18. So well, you have to be 21 anyway. Go get a college degree. It's going to help you. I said, okay, fine. I went back told my mom, I'm going to go to college. This is going to be so cool because I'm going to be a state trooper. And she said, okay, fine. But, you know, nobody in our family's ever gone to college. I'm not sure anyone's smart enough to do it. But, of course, if anyone can, you can. So I thought. <laughs> so I looked around, found a good school. I went to Lake Superior State college at the time, university now, and when I got up there, I had to take five classes, sign up for classes. I didn't think you asked for help. I mean, you're a college student, you should be able to figure out your own classes. So I signed up for, I had to have a math class, so I took physics, I, I, I calculus. I had to have a science course, so I took physics. I had to have a lab course, and I thought, oh man, physics has a lab, but there's no way they'd let you double dip. That seems inappropriate. So I took chemistry, just to be sure. <laughs> and said so you had to have a social science course. I thought, okay, psychology, I love how people think and stuff. And an introduction to criminal justice. So I had my CJ course, my psych course, my calculus, my physics, and my chemistry, and I had my stack of books that cost me like a hundred dollars. So I'm ready to go to college. And I got in there, and, and the first thing that happened to me, and I've got a little TED talk too, which was really fun to do a TEDx, and it was, I, I mentioned in our two, and this, is, this happened to me. The first, first grade I got was an F minus minus. <laughs> It was in my chemistry class, and I thought, I can't call home about this. I can't say, hey, Mom, I got an F minus minus, which she would have said, of course you did. We're not smart like those people. <laughs> By the way, little messages in here for all of your students. When you give a student, when you give, when a student earns an F in your course, and it's fall semester or fall quarter, keep in mind that they're doing what I was doing. I can't call home. Because my family's just going to tell me, yeah, I told you that was a tough place to make it. You know what? You're a smart person. Just come on home is the kind of a tone. Or stick it out. But there's no, you don't have to do. So in this particular case, I worked up the nerve to go to the faculty member. Small school, about 250 faculty. So we have a nice, nice community. And it's, excuse me, I'm so sorry to bother you, Dr. Jones. But I have this F minus minus, and I don't know what it means. Well... Given you received enough minus minus, it doesn't surprise me you failed to comprehend it. <laughs> what I really want to know is could I pass the course with enough minus minus out of the gate? What he told me was I was too stupid to understand what it is I was doing. And that's a problem. So from that point forward, even back then, I started thinking, I want to make sure it's clear between what I'm saying and what students are hearing and what students are saying and what I'm hearing. In terms of what do they mean and what are they saying. So if a student says to you, 
hey, Dr. Z, I missed class Monday. Is there anything? Uh, did I miss anything? That was it. Couldn't make it to class Monday. Did I miss anything? You know that statement? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, many of us in the back of our minds are we're thinking, well, we didn't think there. That's an occipital. Oh, that'd be stupid. In the front of our minds, we're thinking, well, of course you didn't miss anything. Without you there, how could learning even take place? <laughs> we all put our heads down and we mourned your absence. We can think that. We can laugh about it. But the issue is, that's not what the student means. So if you would, please, from here on out, if a student says to you, hey, did I miss anything in class, stop and say, you know, what I'm hearing when you say that is, did you happen to teach anything of Monday that was of any consequence? Is that what you meant? And if the student says, yep, <laughs> that's one conversation. <laughs> now you got up, oh. If the student says, oh my gosh, no, that is not what I meant at all. What I meant was, is there anything in particular that I should prepare so that I'm ready for class on Wednesday? Say, okay, well then form that into a question and ask me that one. And I've had students do this over and over again. Okay, Dr. Z, I'm really sorry I missed class on Monday. Is there anything specifically that I should do so that I'm ready for class on Wednesday? So that's a different question than did you miss anything. And by the way, as a quick side note, um, my daughter heard me talking about this a while ago. She is a sophomore in college right now, and she said, she laughed and she said, you know, my music teacher did that in high school. Anytime a student would say, did I miss anything, she would say, that's rude. Reformulate your question. And she said, to this very day, this is my sophomore daughter, she says, this very day, if I miss a class, I look at an instructor and I say, I'm so sorry for missing class. Is there anything in particular that I should do to prepare for the next class? So these are learning things, as opposed to just kind of moving on. So if the phone rings, if a student comes in late, whatever happens, you say, okay, what's going on here and how can we do this learning? So that was big for me as a first generation college student when I got my F minus minus. I also got a D minus in my intro to CJ class too, so on the first test. He had half of the test was from his syllabus personal statement. In 1972, I was a member of which organization? Oh. <laughs> now, here's what I would say going into this whole thing, still watching the clock and be careful here is if you want to do that, fine, do it. It's not a terrible thing. I know several of you groaned, I would groan too, but that's okay. We all should teach the way we should teach. But tell your students this is important. The concept of they should know this, and the way you teach them a lesson is by failing them on something, and then they'll never let that go again. They could learn that lesson by being told, you need to know this, and then they do well on it. So that concept is letting them know. I personally don't do two-page stories of where I was in 1972, but the concept there is just working through them. So that was my big first-generation college student story. My big thing from there on forward, which was kind of fun, got out of school, made it through. My family came. They were all real proud of me. They all hugged, and they said, what a great person. You've done so many wonderful things. What's next? And I said, I'm going to go get a master's degree. And they said, oh, that is so exciting. So I got my master's degree. They came to the ceremony, hugs and kisses, and, and everyone says, that is so great. What are you going to do? And I said, I think I'm going to get a PhD. And my grandson says, when are you going to get a job? <laughs> <laughs> got the PhD. My grandpa was proud of me. He also was proud of me. Remember, first generation college student, he was like second generation in the country. Um, he's, his call concept was teaching is so, so fabulous of a career for you. I said, thank you. He said, yes. You get June off, you get July off, <laughs> you get two weeks at Christmas, you get a weekend for that. I said, no, no, that's not what teaching's about. But anyway, the point is, I'm going to wrap it up. Went off, got my degree, finished, got the job at Lake State. I do have to feel remiss if I didn't tell you. I rescinded tenure in Southern Oregon University to take the job at Central Michigan for a move for the family situation. But if you ever hear of someone who rescinded tenure in the Pacific Northwest to take an at-will administrative job in Michigan during budget cuts, that was me. <laughs> Built a big center. We went from a $150,000 budget to an $850,000 budget because we demonstrated to a campus what happens when you support teaching, much like what's happening here. It's a really cool thing to invest in. And then from there, I just kind of bounced around a little bit. But I will tell you the very last thing is that when I applied to North Carolina, first-generation college student means I have imposter syndrome. I don't really believe I'm all that great. Someday someone will figure it out. But until then, I'm having fun. So I applied for the job because a friend begged me to. They interviewed me, and I still thought, no way I can get this job. They called me and said, we'd like to offer you this job. 3,000 faculty members, and you're the faculty development director. I later moved over to the medical school, which is where I'm at now. And I told my wife, Honey, they just offered me the job at UNC for faculty development director. And she said, we've been married now 33 years. She said, 
Only in America could you get a job teaching teachers how to teach at a school you could never have gotten into. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you a kind of a framework of where I'm at and where I'm from, and I do that for just a couple of minutes because we'll spend a bit of time together today, and I love the comments from Charles. I'm going to have to call you Charles because I'm Dr. Strain on it. So you introduced this, Charles, I'm going to go with that one. Love those comments. And the one thing I would like to piggyback on is two, actually. Number one is teaching is an amazingly, amazingly difficult task. Mm -hmm. If anybody ever feels like, I got this down, including me, I think you're done. I think that you look around you. What I like to do is I like to walk along, and I don't want to be depressing about this, but I walk around and think of what has changed in 30 years. If you just pause and think just right now, what has changed in 30 years? The laptops that we carried 30 years ago and what they look like. <laughs> the iPhones 30 years ago and what they look like. <laughs> The jumbotrons that take up an entire football field and 30 years ago what they look like. The designer drugs that actually you can take a pill and it will go to the spot it needs to go to and deal only with the organism, microorganisms it needs to deal with. How in the world does it know 30 years ago what did that look like? 30 years ago what did teaching look like? And I think that there's lots of things that we can do to keep pushing our profession. And I'm not saying that, that we haven't moved forward because we actually have. It's just that I think we constantly got to be pushing it. And keeping in mind what Todd Whitaker said so many years ago, too, is teaching is the profession that makes all professions possible. I don't ever want to be pushed around by any profession because I made, I'm part of a community that made their job possible. If a legislator comes up and says, you know, I'm not sure higher education is doing what it should, say, where did you go to school? So that concept of I think we're doing some really cool stuff, but we need to keep pushing it. We need to keep doing that. And I think that's, that's a really important thing to do. Um, that's just a great message. It's going to be from there. All right, so playing around with that concept then. So, well, I guess I should say the last one. Here's the thing. I can't figure this out. This is one I can't quite get, so I need some help from people. We've got this great community, but by and large, we don't teach teachers how to teach, right? We do things like this, which is great, but wouldn't it be weird if our, if our whole field said every month you have to advance yourself by studying and learning how to teach better at least 10 hours a month, two and a half hours a week? Right now we would say, where would we find the time? But what if we had started with that model? That's just part of the job then. It wouldn't be, it's like, how do I find time to teach? I can't teach my class, I don't have time. That's a weird statement, isn't it? <laughs> but I can't read these journals because I don't have time, it's kind of the add-on. So if it wasn't an add-on, that'd be good. But we don't buy a large teach teachers how to teach. But the other cool thing is we don't teach our students how to learn. Students come to us with a model and a framework for learning that they generated, typically, that they generated themselves when they were probably about six or seven years old, when they really started studying flashcards and started learning uh, multiplication tables and stuff. And they built on that. So they've got a, a, a framework from maybe being seven or eight years old that they have built on and built on and built on. You know what a house looks like if you keep adding to it and making changes and everything else? 20 years later, it looks like a really strange house. Every once in a while, you raise the building, so to speak, and you say, let's get down to the core of things and put in a new foundation and really, really rethink this. I would love it if students would come off to come to college and we would actually work with them for a while and say, let's talk specifically about how to learn. So that's one of the big rampages I'm on. That's why I love this whole theme today. And of course, I can't let anybody off the hook. So administrators, where do you go to administrator school? Do you go to dean school, to provo school, to president class? Um, sorry, I can't come next week. I'm in the president's seminar on how to be a good college president. We basically have a system where these individuals learn on the job. So we all kind of learn on the job. So I guess just keeping in mind, it'd be really cool. And that's why I, I helped rebuild the faculty center at um, UNC Chapel Hill was we actually changed it from a teaching center to teaching, scholarly work, and leadership. And the concept was, let's help people all work at their jobs. But it's a neat concept, just keeping that in mind. All right, now, playing around with some of this teaching stuff. I was in a doctor's office a while ago, and this was before I started working in the medical school, so it was a little different. There. I saw somebody pull out a Sudoku puzzle, they filled out the puzzle, and then they pitched it off into a recycling bin, pulled out another one, and did the second one. And then they finished that one, threw it off to the side, and it did very quickly. It was probably there for 15 minutes or so. And they started the third one, and I'm thinking, I can't get my students to do homework. And this person's filling out these puzzles and not getting any credit for it at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I gotta ask you real quickly, and we're gonna ask you just to come up with this one. So um, I gotta play around with different things. I'm gonna ask you actually to turn to your neighbor and give you about a minute to do this. Talk to your neighbor and you in the overflow room too. Which one's the overflow room camera? Is this one in here or is it somewhere else? That's your overflow. Okay, overflow people, you gotta do this too. Um, just turn to your neighbor. Actually, three, groups of three would be ideal. Okay? Yeah, this, some of you are so smart because you've looked really quickly like this. <laughs> And the reason I say that smart is that there's nothing more awkward than being in a workshop or being in a class and the teacher says, okay, big pair of hair, turn to your neighbor, and you go, ew, no. <laughs> That's just mean. So what you do, of course, is anytime someone says, okay, we're going to be in the group, you go like this. <laughs> That's just nicer. Okay, so <laughs> groups of three. I'm going to give you all of, i got to use my timer here because I keep losing track of time. I'm not careful here. I'm going to give you like 90 seconds, and that's why, quick 90 seconds, let me get my timer. I'll use this a couple times, so there's my timer. Oh, good. 90 seconds. Think of anything you can think of, the list as long as you can, or whatever you want to think of is, why would a person do these, I mean, crossword puzzles and Sudoku's, I mean, crossword puzzles for the longest time, people spend an entire day doing a New York Times Sunday puzzle. What is it about these puzzles that really drive people to complete them? Okay, groups of three, 90 seconds, and you mark the set, go. <laughs> All right, so let's see what kinds of things you came up with. So I'm going to start leading off by what I heard in the other room. I ran over to the overflow room. <laughs> First of all, you guys are doing fabulous work. <laughs> so a couple of things I heard in the overflow room um, for people that are working in groups, and then one of them I heard, I heard them talking about challenge, in challenge. I heard somebody else talking about the fact that there's a structure so you understand what it is you're doing. So I don't want to let them have all of the say. So that's two things from over there. So what are some other things? What are some things about puzzles that kind of drive you to it? Yes, back here. You can finish them. You can yeah. finish them. I, 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 every day at breakfast, I swear. I do, I do either a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle every day. One of those two. And you, so you, you can finish them. You know when they're done, right? Yes. So you have, a, you have a completion point. It's like, okay, now I get it. I'm done. I've done that. So it's a feeling of accomplishment. You got this cute accomplishment. Yes. It comes with an automated sense of affirmation. Nobody yeah. has to affirm that you have done a good job when you've completed it. You get that automatically. Yes. Yeah. And so some of you have already picked up on this. I'm just trying to draw some analogies into actual learning that we can do in the classroom. But a lot of learning doesn't happen in the classroom. So we have this, and I'm going to keep calling on a few people, but I just want to put that out there as a signpost. So this concept of being able to complete, to have the affirmation of knowing you did something. Yes. You feel smart. You feel, why do you feel smart? Because you've accomplished it, right? All right, that's good, yes? It makes your mind work in a different way than you do for your job. Excellent, well it might, depends on what your job is. <laughs> if your job is somebody coming in, uh, I have a four letter word for you. <laughs> <laughs> five letters. <laughs> Okay, so, but yeah, it's, you're right, it's, it's kind of a mentally challenging thing that's different from what you normally do. Yes? It creates the rush of dopamine. It gets the rush of dopamine in there, and where does this dopamine come from? Uh, the challenge of solving a puzzle and doing something novel and unique. Yes, we'll come back to that in a second, that's a good one, yes. No pressure to perform. Oh, it takes the pressure away. So you can do it without somebody actually hovering over you. Great, oh yes, we're here. Meditation or escape. Escape. Okay, so you can get away from kind of like the concept up there. You get away from what you normally do. A couple of more. You chose it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You chose it. So the person who is filling this out made the choice, the volition of I would like to do this and then engage in doing it. Yes. You can do it on your own time when you want to do it. Excellent. Asynchronous entertainment. You can kind of <laughs> learn and have fun when you want to learn and have fun. I'm going to come over here first. Yeah, tactile. You're using your body. Oh, tactile. Actually, so yeah, so you're using something different again, but it's, you're actually filling it out. It's tactile, that's good. Yes. In fact, it's an interesting one because I've got this on a phone, and I don't enjoy it as much as I do with a paper and pencil. And it's a strange little thing, but something about writing the letters in my life. So, a couple more up here. Yes. You can do it solo, or you can collaborate. You pass it along to the next person. To you can pass it along. That's good. That's good for collaboration possibilities. So, a couple more. Two more. Yes. It's fun. It's fun. So, what makes it fun? See, these are the terms. Now, see, now I've got to turn into my psychologist for this <laughs> Because, yes, to say it's fun, you could say it's fun. It's like learning is enjoyable, but then the next thing should always be, why is it fun? What is enjoyable? Because so you don't like, realize that you're learning. Like, you don't realize that you're you working at something. It's, you're, you're solving a puzzle, mm -hmm. 
kind of by default here, and that can be fun, is that you're completing something and solving it, but that's what is after. And the last one, yes, right here. Well, I, people have been talking about completion, and I thought, well, you can stop when you want. Yeah, it, the puzzle really rarely <laughs> says, seriously, you're going to stop now, <laughs> like, and, and you aren't going to finish, but it's your choice to do that. Yes. Oh, okay. did you hand it? Oh, yeah, and finally, I, to add to that last comment of why it's fun to answer the dopamine comment, it's incrementally rewarding a lot of the way, because it's, you, you, it's got structure in the sense that you know you completed this line, this line, that line. Yeah. So you get rewarded constantly. That's true, you yes. Feel, how you feel you feel yourself approaching completion. So really, really good point. It's got sub goals to it. Yeah. You you figure if I can just get something on this line, it helps me move toward an overall goal. So when we set up our classes, when we set up our projects, thinking through what are some sub goals we can do. Can we get it at the right level? I mean, if you're not careful here, these puzzles, if I see something and I'm in a hurry and it's a puzzle to level three or four, I say, like, I don't have time for that. If I see level one and it's a Saturday afternoon and I got some time, I'm thinking I'm going to do something else. It's level one's kind of boring. But if I'm on the plane and it's landing and I see a level one and I'm thinking, I wonder if I can get this level one puzzle done by the time the wheels touch the ground and the door opens. So now I've created a little puzzle or a little challenge for myself. It's a little more dope than me. I like the dope than <laughs> a couple of quick side notes. Old, old time. I wasn't even going to mention this one, but it just reminded me when you said about that dopamine stuff too. Um, but old psych study about rats with implanted electrodes in the brain for the pleasure center, hooked to a little bar you could push. Remember this one? Yeah. And a dish of food over there. All I got to do is stop pushing this bar and go over and eat, and come right back, and I can push the bar. Think about how much time they spent pushing that bar. You know what happens to the rats? They starve to death. <laughs> that dopamine release, that feeling of pleasure of like, I've got this thing right there in that part of my brain is so intense that they will not stop from this. Now, there are chemical substances out there that replicate this, which makes danger, drugs extremely dangerous and very, very addictive. So is learning. <laughs> and it has great side effects. So if you think about the side effects of learning as a drug. But that concept here, so it's the challenge level, it's what is sub goals, all those things is happening. But if you think about your classes, and I'm not talking about, yes, you could go down that role of saying, having gaming in the classroom, and there's lots of really neat stuff about learning and gaming. But even if you don't go down that road, turning your whole class into a game of sorts, when you give homework problems, what kind of homework problems are they? Can they complete them? Are they at the right level? Are there sub goals? Can you take a part of one problem and put it into something else? Do they see the broader spectrum of what they're doing? Or are they just filling something out because we say do these problems? For years I taught statistics. Do the odd number problems in the back of the book. And the concept was if you finish those problems, it would practice enough that when it come time for a test, you would do well on the test. Oh my gosh, that's hideous. <laughs> but a lot of people do that. And instead, you turn into a little game of, here are four problems I want you to complete. And after you complete those four problems, I'd like to, you to explain to me why it is I picked those four problems. What about these four problems? Or how about this one? Here are four problems I'd like you to complete. Please write a fifth problem that deals with this area, but isn't the same as one of these four problems. That starts to become a whole different gig for doing homework in terms of that. In fact, there's a calc prof a few years ago, he wrote up about, wrote this, and he said, instead of giving just his set of calculus problems, he would give a smaller set of calculus problems, and then the question, what am I going for here? What did I want to teach you with these problems? What did you learn? Asking the student to reflect on finishing those problems. And what he found was that, first of all, more students finish the problems, because you have to finish the problems in order to answer the last one, but they also learn so much more about what was going on. So puzzling can be great, but that dopamine rush, all the things you mentioned, can be extremely powerful. I mean, it can go to some extreme levels. So here's extreme levels. This is a puzzle. See the little, right at the very top, see that little light, lighter color spot up there? That's a dollar bill that's been folded and placed at the end of this puzzle. This puzzle is about five feet wide and ten feet long. My family put this together. This was my family doing the second puzzle that we did after we, not the second in our lives. We practiced the puzzles before we went to this, but we also put this puzzle together. 24,600 pieces, I think it was, just under 25,000 pieces. What does that look like in action? It looks like this. Wow. This is my stepbrother, this is my daughter, and this is my older daughter. 
So that's the three of them. This is a five by five foot, um, actually it was the table from our outside our patio table. It became our sorting table so that you can see what she is working right now on are pieces that are black. Over here, this puzzle happens to be five feet wide and 15 feet long. 15 feet long, which means, and I just want to point this out for something that just shows you how crazy people can get. You find a piece from the sorting table and you know it goes on that end, and that would be three, six, nine, 12, 15 feet. And then you come around the side and say, click, there it goes. That's how big the puzzle is. Now, you get to doing something like this because we started with a clicker, and every time you put a piece in, you would click. Anybody who would hit the clicker, everybody would cheer, especially at the beginning. That became the dopamine rush. I found a piece in the world's largest puzzle. <laughs> and little by little, we had our sub goals. We had to do certain areas. You do certain areas. This was actually, we started to do the edge piece, but by the way, in a large puzzle like this, you don't do the edge first because then you can't reach the middle. But the point is, you figure out strategies. <laughs> we worked on this thing for nine months because much like Chicago, there's not a lot to do from November to May. So, <laughs> there was bowling night, and there was puzzle night. <laughs> but anyway, the point is we did that. But all of the things that people do, when you look around you, all of those amazing things, and I'd love to look at systems that are outside and draw them into education. If, if, if people could do something like this, we can get people to do some amazing things. But there is no way that if you throw a great big puzzle into somebody's lap and say, put this together, they're going to do it. There has to be stuff to get them to that spot. This individual didn't decide one day, I think I will try gardening. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go hiking. Is it like people driving down through here? By the way, this is um, Glencoe in Scotland. And if you're driving through here, it's not. Uh, there were so many people, the tour buses would open and folks would step out and go snap, 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 and get back on the bus. <laughs> I stepped out of the bus and I looked at, stood right at the edge when I snapped this picture and I said, oh my gosh, if you could just freeze time and give me three days to just walk through these hills. I would love it. Several of you here would. But you have to get to that point. Nobody just one day says, I wish I could walk through these mountains. You start with walking through the neighborhood. And so all these things that we start doing that become obsessions are things that start with little things and we build on them. And I put this in here too. This is a, a I actually bought this print for my daughter. It's a very common print. But you don't one day say, I know, I'm going to build skyscrapers and start walking on I-beams up there like that. <laughs> These guys will jump up an I-beam and walk across there. Not anymore. you got all the straps and everything. You know, life's become so safe. Um, <laughs> but when you stroll across an I-beam like that, there's a great thing about the brain, and we know this about the brain, habituation and sensitization. Habituation, sensitization. As you do something over and over again, you can habituate to it. And as you habituate to it, you don't notice it as much. So having you do three hours worth of homework, for instance, or to work on a paper for four hours is pretty intense unless you've done it for a while. My wife's a nurse practitioner. She was a nurse practitioner. Now she does some, um, She works at home working on conferencing stuff. But the issue is when she was a nurse practitioner and I was a college professor, if she sat still at a desk for more than 30 to 45 minutes, her back would stiffen up, her legs would get tight. She'd say, I do not know how you sit at a desk all day long. I sit at a desk all day long because I sit at desks all day long. It's not a great thing. I get up and take walks, but there are muscle groups even for sitting jobs. The concept here is you build up to all these things, and this habituation is you get to a spot where you don't notice it as much. In a class, if I have a small paper, a larger paper, and then a largest paper that I have people do, then they seem to do a whole lot better than if I say, by the way, at the end of the semester there's a term paper. If I have them write a paragraph, write this paragraph and turn it in. First of all, have your neighbors read it. Go to the writing center. Have them comment on this paragraph. They'll say, oh, paragraph? You want me to go to the writing center? Yep, I do. Because as you go to the writing center, you get comments from your peers on a very small piece of work. It's really easy to get comments on small pieces of work. And then the next time you write a bigger piece, you realize that comments can be helpful. So it's that concept of kind of working toward things can be massively important like we do. And of course, habituation also works out to a situation, and I put this in here for a reason, is that when you walk into somebody's house and you say, my, it smells like kitty cats in here. <laughs> or if you walk up to a desk and a person says, yeah, I know it's gotten a little bit crazy, and you say, a little bit, um, things can happen where you don't notice this. If you walk to your house tonight and walk through your house and say, I'm going to pretend like I'm coming here for like the first time ever, you would see your house completely differently than you do right now. Because you'd walk in and you'd say, wow, there are lots of things piled in different spots. And it's just, that's what we do. But you walk through it and you don't notice it. 
And the point that I want to make with this one is as faculty members, we've gotten to the point where we walk through our own houses and we don't notice things. I can walk into a classroom and start teaching my students and not realize that after, yikes, 31 years of teaching, that 31 years later when I walk into a classroom and start teaching, it's old, habituated, back to me. But for some of those students, they come in and sit down, and that's the very first time they've ever sat in a college classroom. So I say, okay, everybody, let's get started. Now, in this class, all of a sudden, I'm just kind of dropping into a framework that I've done instead of saying, hey, everybody, so first time in school, huh, at, this, at DePaul. So let's talk a little bit. What are you thinking? What's going on? Not particularly just class. Be dangerous to the question of what do you expect to get out of this class, by the way. I'd like to ask that question. My, my fabulous wife one time wrote for her social psych class, uh, I have no expectations, therefore it's impossible to disappoint. <laughs> I thought it was funny, she thought it was funny, the teacher thought it was a little weird. <laughs> so, but the concept of what are you after, what's going on, asking people what do they think about the class, what are their hope to get out of the class, where are you headed, um, those types of conversations can be great, but just be careful that you don't walk into an habituated situation where you're the one that's all this constant and the students are always changing. Because it doesn't take very long, and all the students feel like the same student, they just change names. And if that happens to you, you've got to step back, kind of like walking through your house and saying, I wonder if I were going to buy this house tomorrow and think about putting an offer in, what would it look like versus how do I live it? And if you walk into a classroom and think, hey, these guys all have different personalities, oh, they're different humans than last group. And I mention that because um, there was an old sad joke that was told of a faculty member years ago at a place I was at. Dr. I'm making this name up, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is becoming more and more bitter because he's been teaching biology for 20 years and the students still don't get it. <laughs> That's a habituation problem. Well done, there's your dopamine. Just in case you want to know what it looks like, it's right there. That's not real size. That's blown up a little bit. <laughs> So we do have this reward center, and if you think about it, how the brain's wired, which is so cool, is that we are wired. I, I love to play this game every once in a while. It's kind of like a, what is it, this is why I'm a psychologist, what is it about how we are structured that makes what we do so, so interesting, but also just possible? Just imagine if we didn't have this for a second, right? Take this away from <coughs> By the way, one of the most powerful things in teaching is just the B button on your, on your keyboard. It just turns the screen black, and you hit any key, and it comes back. You put a model up there, and you want the students to look at it for a second, and then you want to talk about it. If it's a complicated model and you start talking, they'll keep looking. I'll get to multitasking in a second. But you can click a button right there and say, let's just talk for a minute. But imagine for a second you didn't have the dopamine. What if you didn't have a chunk of your brain that for some reason solving a puzzle seems to be enjoyable? Okay. So what would that change? I'm just going to ask you just to quickly come up with a couple things. What would that change in like everyday life right now? If you look around what's going on, what would what would change if you didn't have something like that wired into you? You already got one? Oh, like motivation. Yeah. Yeah, motivation for pretty much anything. But that's a little more global than I was after. What specifically? Pick a specific thing. Yes. You wouldn't pay attention. Yeah. We wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, we'd probably come here paying attention. The reason we pay attention is we pay attention so we can get clues to figure things out. Okay, there's a couple. How about very, very granularly too? Yes, it would be enough one to drive. To drive? It's like, you know, it's fun to like lean in out of traffic. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. The, the, you wouldn't, if you couldn't win at driving games, <laughs> I saw someone, and if it was you, I apologize. But yesterday, walking from the train stop, from the L stop over to the hotel, was great. Crossing a street, and a city bus had blocked off a street, so there was no way, when the light turned green, nobody was going anywhere. Okay? So everybody, you know. Except the guy on the sidewalk. Yes, so I got on the sidewalk. So what happened was, the guy on the sidewalk crossed against the light, walking parallel. This is the bus. You're ready to drive across the intersection. The bus has got the entire intersection. Everybody's crossing over here because the light's now red in this direction. This light's green. Guy walks across in the middle of the street. Person with a car goes, Arr. I love Chicago. In New York, it would have turned obscene really, really fast. This guy turns and says, where are you going? 
in Chapel Hill where you have to end up merge to the right, but you can see for like a mile. And my wife will say, aren't you going to merge? I'll say, right after that white truck right up there. <laughs> He's like 15 cars in front of you. I said, yes, but I've calculated my speed and that lane's <laughs> clear sailing here. And I noticed that he has backed off three times from the car in front of him, always creating a space. I just need to get there. And then it's the game. And if I don't get there, then I've lost, but at least I've played. <laughs> now, sports, wouldn't have really done that whole NFL thing, right? All the sports would become boring, but so would things like finding food. I mean, that concept of you're walking around and you think, oh, I'm hungry, wow, that looks great. And you walk in, you get the food, you've just won the, the eating game. Um, if you go to sleep at night and you say, I'm exhausted, and you see your bed, you just won the sleeping game. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we do, and if we're not careful, we don't set it up right, but we can set it up. We can set a class up so the class, again, is something with all these little tiny things people do, they become habituated and they move on. Huge, huge reasons that this works out well. <laughs> um, so I wrote this little book called How Students Learn, and it's kind of funny because in the book it talks a lot about how people process information and learn, and one of the things I loved about it, which is fun, is that my, I tried to convince my daughter for the longest time to turn her, I mean it's things like this, this exact example isn't in there, but like, turn your <coughs> cell phone off when you read. And this is part of the whole day is about teaching your students how to learn. Tell them to experiment with learning. Students will say things like this. Um, listen to music. Let's go that one first. Listen to music while you read. Listen to music while you study. I cannot find any study out there that says listening to music while studying augments or enhances learning. I can't find it. I can find studies that indicate that if you have white noise in a room, that that can enhance learning because it distracts you from the noises. So anybody who says, well, I listen to music because it takes away the background noises. Well, that's true if you don't listen to the music. You just let the music take the noises away. But if you periodically find yourself humming along with it, what happens is you may say you're not listening to music. And by the way, the way the brain works on this is really cool. I'll get to multitasking completely, but you cannot focus cognitively on two tasks and think heavily at the same time about two different things. So sometimes I walk into the room and my daughter says, I can't study without music playing. I'll walk into her room and she's studying and there's no music playing. I thought you had to have music playing. She said, oh, oh, it stopped. Okay, and it was the door open after a couple times it stopped, so then she hits the button and it starts up again. I said, but weren't you just studying? She said, yeah. So the music wasn't playing. Uh-huh. Okay, so then we move on. So she had to have the music, but what she does is she tunes it out to the best of her ability. But also, every once in a while, I walk by the room and she's singing along. So the concept is that we, we, our brain will follow whatever is interesting. <coughs> If you're listening to Pandora and you're kind of tuning it out and all of a sudden a really good song comes up, your brain will go over there but your eyes will keep going on the paper. So the point here is just try it both ways. Put the, put the music off, try reading. If you want to have it so light that you can't really understand the words or it can't understand the music but it's got something, or get a white noise generator, but you can pra practice with these different things. Um, but the concept of putting a phone down while texting and, and students will like, they'll text while they're reading. Text, read, text, read. Those types of things are very disruptive, but unless you practice at it, you habituate, you get to a spot, but the next thing you know, you're sitting on the phone, or sitting on the couch, talking on the phone, reading the paper, and doing all this stuff. Um, the problem is, and there's a lot of words here, so I'm just going to give you a chance to take a quick look here. I can't tell if the overflow room can read this or not, so i got to do this real quick. 86% of students reporting texting throughout entire class periods. Again, I'm, I'm focusing a big chunk of today's presentation on habituation. Nobody starts out texting all the way through the class period. They start out, they text a little, they listen a little, they text a little, they listen a little. A couple weeks later, they're texting a lot, listening a little. Next thing you know, you're just texting. But these are things we build up to. 
However, this is one of the best studies around out of Stanford. Chronic, and I shouldn't call it multitasking, it's really task shifting. So let me just do this one really quickly too. I gotta just differentiate this. All kinds of people out there talking about multitasking. This generation's great at multitasking. People saying you can't multitask. Let me just try to do this from a cognitive behavioral psychologist viewpoint here who works with neuroscience like people. <clears throat> Number one, students are good at multitasking, but unfortunately they're no better than their grandparents were. <laughs> The human brain doesn't change that fast. It's not like all of a sudden we've evolved into a whole different brain. 100 years from now will be a slightly different. 1,000 years from now will be quite a bit different. But the brain takes a little while to evolve, so you can't just automatically be good at something unless it's a skill you can learn. Now, the problem with the multitasking concept, here's the problem. It's not a skill set you're learning. It's a way of using your brain. So if I focus on something that is... I gotta back up one last step. Control versus automatic processing. I'm gonna go back to there. Control process. Control process means basically I have to put energy into it. When I learn to tie my shoe, make a loop, make another loop, first loop around the other loop. This is the bunny beer, bunny method. <laughs> Second loop and then pull it. Now I tie my shoe. I have to think that through. When you first started walking, all of you, do you ever notice when you've got a baby that starts to walk? The first couple times they're walking, if you say, oh, what a big boy, what happens? <laughs> fall down. <laughs> By the way, those of you who don't know this, the reason that psychologists have children, no IRB committees. <laughs> so when my daughter started walking, I would say, oh, look at you, big girl. She'd look over her shoulder and fall down. I think, oh, that's looking behind her. I wonder if I was in front of her. Prop her back up. <laughs> Get in front of her. Look at you walk. And then she gets a big smile and takes another step and then falls down. Hmm. Balance does do better when you don't have to turn your head. I'm going to try from the side. But the kids fall down. My daughter still says she remembers me when she was learning to tie her shoes. Tie your shoe. You say, what are you doing? Tying my shoe. It's all fine. Tying your shoe. What do you want for lunch? <laughs> Think about what you want for lunch and tying your shoe at the same time. Tying your shoe is a controlled process until it becomes so ingrained. Another thing your brain does, if you do something over and over and over and over again, the, the neurons fire easier, more easily, and more easily, and more easily. Long-term potentiation, making that task less cognitively demanding. That makes total sense. The things we do often are the things we should be good at doing. So the brain takes away the energy to do that. Now you tie your shoes and you talk. When you first started driving, you had to really concentrate. Now you don't. I mean, you do concentrate, especially if it's the game, but mostly you go down the road listening to music and chatting with people. Watch what happens to people when you get one of those nasty driving rainstorms where it starts to snow. Turn the radio off, everybody shut up. Knuckles get white. It's a new game. You just shifted from automatic to controlled process. Now, here's the reason the multitasking thing becomes difficult. You can multitask as long as at least one of those tasks is completely automatic, or at least only one task is controlled. Everything else is automatic, and then you can do it. So look at me, I am multitasking right now. <laughs> I am talking and I'm walking. Oh, triple tasking. <laughs> this is great. Stop talking. Now, I did stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> Dang, that almost never happens. You can ask my family. Okay. Now, so I can do multiple things like that. However, I cannot train my brain to listen to two conversations at exactly the same time. And the reason is, walking is a, is a process that once the neurons fire and you're actually walking, there's nothing else to it. When you are talking, I have to process the information that I'm hearing. And by processing the information I'm hearing means I can never groove that into an automatic process unless you say the same thing over and over and over again. If you said, what are you doing tomorrow? 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 That would train. Now, though, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing tomorrow? I could listen to that, and I could listen to another conversation. I would now be listening to two conversations at the same time. I'd be listening to this conversation tell me something, and over here I would hear, what are you doing tomorrow? And it just turns into a, and I think, okay, I got it. But the point is, then I can multitask. But if you're saying new things, not possible. So the, the worst part of this, the insidious piece, the insidious piece is, that people who do it frequently, who actually do multitask or task shift frequently, were terrible at ignoring irrelevant information, terrible at keeping information in their head neatly and organized, and terrible at switching from one task to another. 
People who do this all the time think they're getting better and better at it. They're actually getting worse and worse at cognitive processing. This isn't like getting worse at walking or something, which would be bad. This is getting worse at actually thinking. This, this task of jumping back and forth isn't just irritating to us. It isn't just frustrating because it's rude on the part of our students. It's actually grooving their brains to not process information well. We have got some big issues coming. This is horrible. It is very much horrible. And think of it this way. If right now I walk along and I'm concentrating on my environment, but I'm walking and I'm concentrating and I'm thinking about things, that's enough for me. Now, check this out. If I'm texting and walking, what I need to do is scan so that I don't hit anything, right? So without really thinking about it, what's happening here is as I'm texting, I'm immediately, I'm constantly doing this, right? So what I'm doing, and I'm not doing it at that level. I'm just trying to exaggerate a little bit. When I'm doing this, what I'm really doing is saying this is what I would be doing with my brain. But I'm doing it from here, just micro, like, quick, quick things. But that's what I'm doing. I'm engaging in a task while I'm going like this the whole time as I'm doing this. Now when it comes time to actually focus on something, it becomes really, really difficult. Here's a, here's a game I want to try with you guys. And this, I got, sorry I can't have any winners in the, the other room, but I apologize for that. I'll make it up to you somehow. 30 seconds. Clear your minds. Don't look at any clocks. Don't set any timers. I'm going to set a timer for 30 seconds. And what I'd like you to do is at 29 and a half seconds, uh, we'll go there. Yeah, tap your table. That'll be better. Tap the table at 29 and a half seconds. Actually, 29.9 .9 seconds. <laughs> when I say 30 seconds, if I clap my hands and say that's 30 seconds, if you have not tapped the table at that moment, you are out of the game, lost, because you've gone beyond it. It's the closest to 30 seconds without going over. And what I'm really after here is what does 30 seconds feel like? So when you think it's 30 seconds, tap the table. Now, I will tell you this much. I have had entire groups go past 30 seconds with nobody touching the table. So if you're thinking to yourself, I think that's 30, but nobody has tapped yet. That's weird. You might tap the table, and it might be 29 seconds, and then everybody else lost, and you just won. Okay? So when you feel the 30 seconds, <laughs> on your mark, clear in your head. 30 seconds, on your mark, get set, go. Just tap the table at the 30 seconds. second difference it's like just a hair before and a hair after but you know this is so you want to book you in a Bloom's taxonomy slider this, this fabulous part let me tell you what you've won this is like all the Bloom's taxonomy they got birds and assessment questions and instructional strategies um, you can you can buy that on Amazon so, um, here's what I want though, I gotta move on now, but the first, you guys did a really good job, the first table was hit at 16 seconds. <laughs> I did this a while ago and the first person was with a group of students, first person hit the table, 8 seconds. <laughs> yeah, think about that. I want you to be quiet for 30 seconds. This, it's all fun and games until we start to think this is what we're doing to our brains. That we're getting in a situation that if a person doesn't look up, check the text, do something within a couple of minutes, it feels like forever. So in your class, that idea that if you don't shift things up every 12 minutes, the students get bored, they're not doing things, that game is gone. 12 minutes is a, can you imagine that's 30 seconds. If I said, okay, let's just sit and be quiet for 12 minutes. <laughs> first of all, and it also, I shouldn't say first of all, it also shows how sad it is that we don't just sit back and relax. By the way, the people who are best at this one are people who do meditation and yoga. Mm -hmm. yeah, people just sit back and say, oh, really? 30 seconds gone already? Wow. 
But a lot of people, it's a lot, it's the time moves fast. So we have to be careful with this. The other one is, um, that's just something I found. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be something <laughs> There used to be something we call the Blackberry Prayer. And the Blackberry Prayer is when somebody would be at a table like this and all of a sudden they do this. <laughs> and it's like, really, we didn't see that? And the less obtrusive way of actually texting someone is for, to find the person right in front of you and put the phone a little bit in front of you and behind their back. And then you can text like this. <laughs> but those students don't seem to get. And I, I found this back when I used to teach classes of 250, 300, twice the size of this room. In this size room, check this out. Students wouldn't understand this, how I could catch them cheating. We all know the gig. They just don't get it. We can't tell them because you don't want to, you don't want to blow your pipeline of information. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> how'd you know I was cheating? <laughs> well, because there's like this little white flag that got flashed. <laughs> people do the same thing with texting. It's like they'll be in class and they'll be going, right. <laughs> and then you say, put the phone away. I said, well, I'm, I don't have a phone. Well, then that's a different problem. <laughs> All right. So here's the study that was done here, which is pretty cool. Individuals put in front of a computer with internet access. And they were told they have 30 minutes and they can look at the television or they can play on the computer, they can flip back and forth however much they want. And as they flip back and forth, they just, just experience life. And when it was done, they said to this group, how many times do you think you shifted from one thing to the other? And the estimate was 15 times, which would put an attention span at two minutes. Uh, on the average, every two minutes, look at the TV, think, ah, oh, it's enough, I'm going to the computer, that's enough, I'm going to go back to the computer, or back to the TV, right? But that, of course, is self-report, which we know is hideously flawed. So we go to the videotape. Whoops. 120 times. 120 times is about six seconds on the TV, or a computer, and two seconds on the TV. If you think to yourself, there is no way. Watch one of your kids or a significant other or yourself the next time you're like watching TV and you happen to have your cell phone with you. It's like, oh, that's a neat show. It's like 1,001, 1,002, text away, 1,001, 1,002, text away, 1,001, 1,002. I watch this over and over and over again. So we have to be careful with this process. In classes, I've heard one faculty member, I thought it was great, have tech free time. You've got to be careful about saying no laptops, by the way, be really careful with that. No laptops has an issue because students with ADD and some other learning challenges actually do way better in class when they type on their laptop than when they take notes by hand. So that you actually might be, if you say, everybody put your computers away, there's no computers in this class. If you happen to have somebody in your class with ADD and they haven't even been tested, if they have been tested, that's different. If they haven't even, though, you might be disadvantaging them from learning. I like the concept of it's fine to have laptops in the class, but let's talk about how we're going to use them. But there's periodically times we say, okay, tech-free time, turn the PowerPoint off, turn all your cell phones off, turn your laptops off. We are, for the next 10 minutes, going to just talk. And the students will do that, and then at the end of 10 minutes, you can go back to the next slide. And funny thing is a lot of times, if you're really engaged in some neat stuff, the phones don't come back out. So they stay away. So it's kind of neat. All right. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? <laughs> I like to point this out very quickly because there are people who don't quite understand what the implications of multitasking and, and divided attention actually does. What divided attention actually does is divide your attention sometimes to where it's zero on one thing and a whole bunch on something else. So if we're not careful, what happens is you can park your car, and if what you're worried about when you park your car is to getting the last tickle me Elmo before they're all off the shelf, or running into the store because you're late for a meeting, think about when you've lost your car, or the next time you lose it, think about what happened, what were you thinking when you got out of your car, airports. You're late for your flight, you finally find a place of parking after circling around a bit, you run into the airport, you get in line, you're all panicking about that, you've got your keys, everything's fine, you get all the metal out of your pockets, you get through, I run to the gate, I get on the plane, I sit down, and then I think, oh, I made it. All my focus now is where I'm going. Two days later, I come back to the airport, and it's just about as you're walking into the main concourse area, you go, 
Oh, no. <laughs> you slow down your steps because that's going to give you more time to think. And you come to the parking structure or the shuttle that takes you to the parking structure and they say, which lot are you going to? You think, it's a color. <laughs> I don't know. Well, sir, we've got green, red, and yellow here and they're all big. <laughs> and if instead of really what you tend to do then of course is you try to recreate okay wait a minute when i got out of the car i ran and had to catch it now what you're trying to do is come back and pick some things up mm -hmm. but what typically happens is you engage in a behavior where your attention was divided in somewhere else if students are reading and they're not careful you don't just like this one nobody gets out of their car thinking i hope i don't lose my car today um you just you have stuff in your brain this is the insidious thing about the way your brain works it goes where it thinks you need to go not where you think you need to go. So I could be reading this, and I can get to the end of a chapter and close it, put the book down, and the next day think to myself, oh, I'm going to finish reading that book. Now, where did I leave off? And pick this thing up, if I didn't use a bookmark, and say, hmm, yeah, I read that. I read that. Oh, there's a picture. I remember that picture. Mm -hmm. If you remember the picture, and that's how you remember where you're at in the book, your cognitive processing isn't real high. If you look at something and say, oh yeah, patterns and learning, I remember reading about patterns and learning because patterns do this. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that a lot of times people cannot remember at all what they've read and sometimes not even remember where the book is. So students will do this. I can't find my book. How do you lose your book? This is mostly for your high school kids. How could you lose your calculus book? How could you lose your history book? Well, I don't remember where I was when I put it down. <laughs> The thing is, the attention was divided. So what you have to do is draw the attention back in. So you tell your students, want to help them be better learners? Be mindful while you're learning. When you get out of your car at the mall, all you have to do is get out of your car and say, I choose to not forget where my car is and walk away. Because what you've done is pull the attention back. You don't have to go into an elaborate process of remembering where you're at. You can say, okay, J.C. Penney's is right there and Macy's is right there, so I'm right here. You give myself a general area. But by and large, as soon as you think about your car, you're in the general area. When you're reading your chapter, if you stop periodically and say, what did I just read? That's all you need to do, and it will be more, it'll be, it'll be more better than if you just read. <laughs> there you go. Lose your sunglasses all the time, later you find them on top of the head, all you have to do is come through the door and say, okay, I believe that I will wear my sunglasses on top of my head today. And then you'll know they're there. Or you do it all the time the same way. But the point is, teaching the students and ourselves too, when something like this happens, that's a beautiful opportunity to say, I am going to start thinking about why I'm forgetting stuff, thinking about why I'm not doing this, versus, wow, that's irritating. So that's where you play around with that one. Now, whew, kind of fired up here. And we'll fast here. So, any time we, okay, good. I just want to kind of get a sense of where I'm at in this whole thing. This is from Dee Fink's Creating Significant Learning Environments. Dee Fink has got some good stuff. And I'm sorry I didn't put the updated thing on here. The model is still being used. He's updated the text. It's now a 2013, so it has been updated in 2013. But when you look at this circle, for those of you who have been teaching for a while, remember the old days. If you look at this circle, which part of this circle was always the foundation of teaching? The concept of teaching was where? <coughs> pointing going on. That spot right there, wasn't it? This is the piece of pie. I've got a bunch of knowledge. You don't. Let's see if we can change that. <laughs> that was the game. The issue is, though, that's what we used to do. And when I first taught my class, and it was 1986, a statistic class, I remember it well, and it was that concept of, I know statistics, I need to teach you statistics. But DFINK came along, and others have done this too, is to say, if we're going to teach students, and by the way, I'm hitting this in both areas, the students need to understand this too, that we do both this, we do this also. That we need to teach, for instance, application. <coughs> Teaching knowledge doesn't instill application. You can apply some things, but other things you can't. And the best way, in fact, we, oh, there's so much stuff going on right now in the literature, getting people to apply skills to new problem sets is the biggest focal point it seems like all over the place because people are not good at it you teach that i i did this workshop one time a couple years ago something like this doing the same kind of a model and saying here's some things about teaching here's here's what we did break up into sessions we'll do that a little bit more this afternoon too where you get into small groups you need to do things and at the end someone said that was fabulous i really enjoyed it Whew, if i taught statistics that would be so cool but i teach i teach you know, sociology 
I said, really, so you can't use any of this? And she said, well, you're a site prof, and those were site things, right? And so the point is, not picking on that individual, it's that what she was doing was looking at the knowledge component. These are the pieces, but not thinking about application at all. But you know what I also didn't do? I didn't say, by the way, here's some ways to apply this in different areas. So if I periodically say, oh, you know, you could do this in any class. All I have to say the words, you could do this in any class, and I bring about some application. But you have to bring that up for your students. Integration, teach them how to integrate. So you don't just teach them foundations, you teach them how to apply, how to integrate. And then the whole left side of this is all kinds of stuff we never used to care about. The human dimension, you're learning about yourself. Caring, it turns out, and I like to say this, by the way, and I don't mind being taped saying it, at the very least, if nothing else, and I know this is going to sound like a joke, but I don't believe it is, at the very least, they should think you care. Isn't that funny? That's the very least. That's the bottom level. And then from there, you work your way up to where you do care with the ideal. <laughs> but now as I say this, imagine what would be below this point would be, what if they think you don't care? And that's why I say I think the very least is they think you care. Because I know of students and I know of faculty who say, I don't care if they like me or not. That's not my job. Kind of is a little bit. <laughs> we do know that, I mean, can you imagine a coach? I don't use sports analogies a lot, but I come from a place that played basketball once in a while. Um, that was so funny when I got there. Whole ADD side story on that one. I got there just thinking basketball was a sport, not like a form of religion. <laughs> but Coach Williams there at, at Chapel Hill or Coach K over at Duke or any of the others, Calipari, any of them, could you imagine a really, really good coach, coach here, just saying, okay, guys, you know what, I don't really care. You get out there, you play the best you can, I don't really care for you guys, I don't even like you very much. <laughs> but winning is important, so let's work hard at it. I mean, kind of changes the whole game. So the concept is that we have to do that. By the way, the thing you should at least perceive that you care, they should perceive your care. I still remember one student whose dog bit me during class one time. <laughs> and for those of you who say, ah, I would not allow a dog in my classroom, neither do I. <laughs> she just thought it'd be fun to bring him. And I walked by the desk and it was one of those little tiny yipey things. <laughs> you know, pretending to care. And jumped out of her purse and bit me in the ankle. <laughs> and I thought to her, I thought to myself, well, at least the dog knows that I don't care for her. <laughs> Nobody else does. But the point here is, and they're almost always the point, is that we have to be careful how we communicate with our students and what do we do to show caring and stuff. And by the way, I want to be really careful on this one. That doesn't mean cutting breaks on everything. If you are my students and I tell you, papers are due Friday the 1st at noon, and only in extremely, in extreme circumstances would I ever let you have an extension. Otherwise, it's Friday at noon, period. And you show up, and I say, and now, oh, got to do this right. Four exams in the class, 100 points each. There's a paper worth 100 points. That's 500 points in the class. You show up at 12.02 and say, I'm so sorry, Dr. Z. Uh, the L was running a little bit late, and I had to run. I got caught by this bus that was caught in an intersection, and this guy was honking at another guy. Who was <laughs> Listen to that dude. So I'm like two minutes late, but here you go. And if you go, hey, I'm so sorry, but 12 was the deadline. There are people who say, how could you be so mean? The students especially would say that. But that's not what I mean by caring. Caring isn't to say, oh, I see you had a rough time. Yes, let me take the paper. Caring is I care about you as a human being, and I care that you learn things, and I care that you go forward. And caring could very well be as, I'll oh, sit down for just a second because we're going to have a really unpleasant talk, and I'm so sorry. But I'm not going to take that paper because the deadline was noon. You knew it was noon because we've had three other papers in this class, and you know I've never accepted anybody's paper. It was like <coughs> three or worth 10 points each, but I've never taken them. I've had extra credit assignments, and I have never accepted extra credit. If I take that, I, I basically just blow up my whole system. I'm sorry, we worked it through. You could have handed it in yesterday. I'm not taking it. That's still caring. So I just want to be careful it isn't kind of morphed into this concept of caring is that you let students do it whatever they want. It's not it at all. If you can't not accept a paper like that, and by the way, keep in mind, if there's 500 points possible in the class and that's worth 100, that's a zero now. That student has 80 percent is the best they can do if they get 100% on everything else. 
If they've got a B level, they've just about flunked the class. With a B in this class, now they're getting an F because that's not an F, it's a zero. If they hand it to me and got a 50%, that's a different score. So zeros are hugely impacting. If you don't have the intestinal fortitude to look at someone and say, you're two minutes late, you just flunked the class, then what you do is change your policy. Have a different policy. One of my favorite ones is papers are worth 100 points. It's one point per hour that they're late during business hours, 9 till 5. I make them due at 3 o'clock on Friday. If you want to turn it in on Monday morning and take the weekend to keep working on it, Friday at 3 means 4, 5 o'clock is the end of the business time, then it goes around to 8 o'clock in the morning. If you're waiting for me at 8 o'clock on the nose, you get two points you've lost. At 8.01, it's three points. At 9.01, it's four points. You could take the paper for the whole weekend now and only take a three-point penalty. Over half of my students will turn it in late. About half will take it for the weekend, actually about a quarter. And that's fine with me. I have some to read over the weekend, then I read the rest during the week. But the point is, I never look at somebody and say, you failed the class because of this, this minute. So just think it through how you want to do it. But caring and then teaching students how to learn. Huge, huge issue. Now. <laughs> Um, I want to be a little bit careful. I've been lecturing a bit today, quite a bit actually. We've done a couple of small things where you turn to your neighbor. I've asked you some questions and you've responded. So those are all breaking class up a little bit, but I'm lecturing too. I have not yet found a study that says that lectures are not valuable at all. There have been some people out there who've done studies about if you lecture all the time, and those studies can demonstrate that that's not as effective as engaged learning. So engaged versus lectures. There are some studies out there about whether or not students learn anything at all in going to college, which are kind of ugly studies if you look at some of those data points. But the point here is, and I want to be very careful, I'm not saying you should never lecture. I'm doing it right now, and there's times you should do it. I'm saying just be mindful of when you're doing it. But if you do do it all the time, i got to do this one really fast. This is pretty obvious what it is. <laughs> this is from Hake. Actually, Hake, I love this because this is 6,000 data points. This is from um, Richard Hake did this, and it was called 6,000, uh, summary of 6,000 students, I can't, physics class. If you do 6,000 students in physics, it pops right up. Each one of these is an entire class. What he did is he did a pretest in his class, and he did a post test. You take your post test minus the pretest, and that's how much you gain. If on your post test you got 100%, pre test you got an 80, pre test you got an 80, post test you got 100%, then of course you had a 20 point gain. So this line right here is if you did score 100% on the post test. We don't want that, it's the ceiling effect, you never want that. But the point is the closer to this, the more the gain is. These lime green kind of colored things are all interactive lectures or interactive classrooms. Sometimes an interactive lecture like we've been doing here. What do you think of this? What, why would a person, what would dopamine do? What if you didn't have a reward center? Get into groups of three, that kind of stuff. This is a traditional lecture. Traditional lectures are I come in, I lecture to you, and I say if you have any questions, come see me in my office hour. Now although you would think that those were gone, you look around, they're still around. Lots of them still around. What we found, we, as in Richard, found, which really surprised me, is that there should be a couple of lectures up in here, like really good lectures. But I realized later, when I first looked at this grid and thought, why aren't there a couple of lectures up in here? This is kind of neat. They're all down here. And down here is where you also have some interactive classrooms, which, by the way, Jen, you're going to love this one. The message I give you today is stop lecturing and do crappy group work, and you'll be at the same point. <laughs> Um, no, no. But if you do good group work, you're way up here. But actually the joke here is that the people who lecture phenomenally well don't do much better than the people who are doing poor group work, which is interesting. The reason that this happens is it's not about teaching, it's about learning. If you teach really, really well, then the next question is, does that really, and I know it's weird playing with the words like this, you could say, I'm a great lecturer. But are the students learning? What I've just done is separate teaching from learning. You might be a phenomenal lecturer, but are they learning? And the point here is, even if you are a phenomenal lecturer, there are classes out there who can't learn from that. So we have to keep moving that along into the lecturing, or moving into engaged learning. As, so the data is really clear here. 
I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it. This is Kelly Hogan from UNC Chapel Hill. This was the first exam scores in her biology class, broke, broken down by ethnicity. The light green here, line here, first generation college students. African Americans, first generation college students, Latino, Asian Americans, and Caucasian. You see this gap right here? It has been happening since 1970. Actually, it's been documented since the 1970s. D's, F's, withdrawal rates of African Americans in predominantly white institutions is twice that of Caucasians and Asian Americans. Happens over and over and over again. This class has 400 students. This isn't discrimination. This is African Americans not performing. So you might say, well, maybe those students are less prepared. Nope, look at the data, not the case. You cannot account for the variance by preparation. And every time this has happened in the past, and you force people to work in groups, you get data like this. This was the next semester when everybody was told, you will be working in groups during class. I'm going to put you into groups of four, pair up with your neighbor. I want somebody to say something. And all of a sudden, not only did all the ethnicities um, differences disappear, but every group did better than any group, wow. which is pretty wow. darn cool. All she did was start doing interactivity in the classroom. She, by the way, this was in 2011. She's done it for the last several years, and she gets the same findings over and over and over again. So you can really change things considerably. This last one was Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman, actually, he knows a little bit about science and stuff. <laughs> not Feynman, I'm sorry, sorry. No, no, I messed up the that one. It's not <laughs> Now I'm blocking it. What'd you say? Delorier. Uh, Delorier is the first author, but it's the Wyman, Carl Wyman. Wyman. Oh. It wasn't Richard, it's Carl Wyman. It's Delorier is the first author. Carl Wyman is actually a, an author on this study, too. Carl Wyman taught a class for lectures, and this wasn't a great design, but it was kind of cool. He taught a class lecturing. He had his grad students teach a class using interactive techniques, and then everybody took a quiz. These are the grad students' student scores. And this was his students' scores. <laughs> and they report they were massive difference every time they do this. You can take a Nobel laureate, Nobel Prize winning physicist teaching physics and cannot do as well with a lecture as graduate students will do with interactivity. Perfect, Jen. Not only can you just do crappy group work and be as good as lectures, just have your grad students do it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just sit your, and undergraduates could do it too. I mean, as long as it's active learning, you're all good. So what you're really after for the message, I don't want anyone to leave with that one. The real <laughs> message is that if we do, if you take his stuff and make it interactive, that's where you see the massive gains. But the point is, you can't just lecture all the time, and I just throw that in there because Students don't understand this too, but you should use group work, and this is the real reason why. Forget all the data. This is all data. Look at this. They become more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> These students are happy. I don't know what this young lady is looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I heard someone in the group just recently, because I've been showing this a while, she said, I think that she locks her. <laughs> but whatever it is she's looking at, whatever's going on in here, the whole concept is, is like, look at wonderfulness. But I can tell you that this is, might be what you're going for, and this is what we get. <laughs> so, Students, this is all helping students to learn. Um, trying to tie these back. If we teach better, they learn better. If we do different things. Number one on this particular one is if you're going to use group work, please teach your students how to use group work, but also talk to them about why you're using group work. It's amazing to me the number of people who will do groups and not specifically say to their students, I'm going to use groups in here and here's why. You're going to be working in groups and here's why. Okay? Now, done in eight minutes and I wanted to leave ten minutes for questions but I always go over by five but then there's other sessions going on so I should. <laughs> Alright, I was going to have you do a quick like group thing about what is it and I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> if you don't listen then it's just talking. Remember the quote from the beginning. The concept here is if I don't tell you why and if I just say groups are important because you're going to be working in groups the rest of your life. Ah, you know what? You're kind of old and I don't care. <laughs> happened to me just recently. By the way, I was at a McDonald's recently and I got a soda and a small drink and it came to a dollar twenty, a dollar seventy-nine. You know how that happens? A dollar twenty-nine sandwich and a senior soda. 
<laughs> my first thought was, you little piss head. And my second thought was, 50 cent soda. <laughs> so bring that up. Because if you just say to your students, because it's good for you, because you will be working in groups, it's not a good message. It's not a good message. Here's the message that I really, really like. Group work is really important for a couple of reasons, actually three. Number one, which is what most of you probably tell your students, is when you work in groups, you develop interpersonal skills. You're going to figure out how to work in groups in a non-life-changing environment. And I like to point out the non-life-changing environment because the worst thing that's going to happen to you in this class is you might fail this class. And if that happens, it's sad. The next thing that might happen to you is you might have a dream job and you might be put in a group in your dream job and it doesn't work out with your group work and in that case you lose that job. You may never get a job like that the rest of your life. Let's figure out in this class how to do it. Who had your hand up for you? Okay, good. So, number one, non-life changing and chance to practice at getting good at working in groups. And that doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. Sometimes you're going to get frustrated. Someone in the room is going to do, or someone in the group is going to do a lot of work. Someone else is going to do none of the work. Here's, and then help them. Here's ways to figure it out. Here's two more. I already mentioned long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiations, the more the neurons fire, the better they fire. There's a big difference between encoding information and retrieving information. Encoding information, and the more I read, the more I do things, the better I can read, and the better I can process the information. If I want to get better at retrieving it, I have to practice at retrieving it. When you work in groups, you will talk things through, and every time you talk something through, you're grabbing information and you're pulling it out. You are practicing and retrieving information. In this class, you will learn many things about this class through group work because you're going to practice at retrieval. It's also, by the way, in this class, why I will call on you. It's why I give you quizzes. It's why I put you into small groups and have you do quiz bowl kinds of things. I want to practice at retrieving. That's number two. Number three. A fundamental way that everybody learns is through elaboration. You learn through elaboration in a sense that as you can tie things to other things, it makes it easier for you to recall those things. Mm -hmm. If I said, who was the first president of the United States? Bam, it's right there. Because you've practiced retrieving it several times, but also because you can elaborate it. If you, for some reason, blocked on the name of the first president, you have states, you have counties, you have cities named after this person, you have monuments named after this person, his face is on money, on both paper and coins. There's a, a wide web out there and all you need to do is activate a piece of that web and it can track back and give you a name. When you get into groups and talk, you develop a web of knowledge. Because you said something that's really cool, that you said something really cool, and you said something really cool, and then I say something, and later when I have to remember it, it's like, oh, you know, it's like what Joe said. Or, I remember when Sam told me this. Those stories that come in, are, and this reason stories, by the way, from a cognitive behavioral person, the reason stories are so powerful is they form elaborations. They tie into your back past memories because you remember swimming in the swimming hole like the one that I just said in my story. The person you talked about reminded me of Susie. And then I remember when you said it, we were standing in the cafeteria. All these are webs. So when you sit down and rip through flashcards, you don't have webs. You just have you have that recall, which is good. Practice a recall from flipping through flashcards, but no webs. Working in groups, practice it in our personal skills. To develop elaborations and practice at retrieval. That's what you get out of this. So I'm never going to have a quiz question or a test question that's about the stuff you did in your group, but you will learn so much through it. And the study after study after study says you do. And this is where I'm going to end. Mostly because this is the ending time. <laughs> Keeping in mind, I'll leave you with this one, which is another one to help your students with, which is really, really important. There's so many cool things. What I tried to get today were some of the things where students will say, but I don't like working in groups. Why do we have to work in groups? Because I said so. So now you got a little thing. Multitasking. I can multitask. Well, yeah, and guess what? You're getting worse and worse at thinking because what you're doing and you think it's multitasking is making it worse. Here's one last one. Why should I have to learn something when I just look it up on my phone, right? So here's your answer to that. Most of your life, and it's another one, good one. I love it when people ask me to come and do these things and I make them look good for this one. Here's the other one is, you should tell your students that most of the time they don't think. Now I'm just kind of saying that tongue in cheek, but it's actually true. Most of the time actually humans don't think. We only think when we have to. 
because thinking is not very efficient. It burns a lot of energy, and it's tiring. Imagine at the end of today how tired you will be, because you're going to be thinking all day. That's different than if you go like golfing. And people will say, yeah, but you're outside. No, the one thing with golfing is you can get physically tired from walking around the course, but golfing will make you tired if you're in a tournament or something, but by and large it doesn't because you have muscle memories and you're just doing something and you're moving along. You're not thinking a lot. So here's a thinking example. If you get in your car Saturday morning early, and it may not be a great example for you folks because a lot of you take the L, you don't drive, but imagine you're driving, I'm in Chapel Hill, I drive a lot, right? So I get in my car on Saturday morning, I'm gonna make, make French toast for my family. I have to go to the grocery store and get eggs and milk and some bread. Now, as I'm pulling out of the driveway, I'm thinking, if I hurry up and make this breakfast, and we all have fun, in the afternoon I can finish the manuscript that I have to write, and then maybe tonight I'll wipe out my emails, and then all day Sunday we go to the zoo. Yeah, that would be fun. Now, if I can do that, and I'm driving along, and I park my car, and I think, ah, oh, crap, I'm at the university. <laughs> and I'm like, here I want to go to the grocery store. I back out, and I start to the grocery store. If you pick up your phone from home, and this again, this has gone away, but those of you who are older know this, remember back in the day when we used to have phones and you pick up from home to dial numbers? If you ever dialed nine to get out, you spent too much time in your office. The last one I'll say with this whole thing, if you get into a rental car, watch your behavior when you get into a rental car. You pull out the keys and you lean over and you look for the ignition and then you turn that and you think, okay, windshield wipers are here. If you were thinking all the time, you would do that every time you got in your car. I get my car. Okay, my car. I put the keys in here, turn the ignition, let it go. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. I got to put it in gear. Now, how do you put a car in gear? Oh, it's this thing here that says D. Put it in drive. I'm going. I wonder how I stop. Oh, yeah, there's a pedal. Which one? The middle one. Yes. If I had to do that, wouldn't that be exhausting? Now, here's the deal. If you have to look something up and process it, that's how much energy you have to put into it. Now compare that to the relative ease of just memory. When you leave today, you know where your house is. None of you will think about where do I live. You just go there. When you pick up a book and start reading, that can cause some cognitive energy, but picking the book up, you don't say, I wonder how you open this thing. <laughs> so most of your day is just living. If a student has to look up what an unconditioned, and I will finish in one minute here, if unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus, and conditioned response, I have to look that up, and then I have to figure out what they each mean, you don't have a chance at higher order conditioning. You will never learn generalization, discrimination, secondary, secondary conditioning, secondary reinforcers, all those things are gone because you're still trying to figure these things out. So the reason you can't just look up the basic aspects of our field is that you have to know that so you have room to think. And that's why this is a really big deal, it's telling them it's better to memorize basics so you can think about the complex stuff. And that's why you're at a university. You're figuring out the basics and you're getting that foundation so that you can build on that in a meaningful way. I'm going to finish now because, I, as I mentioned, I usually go five minutes over. If I stop now, I'm actually four minutes early. <laughs> I'll be here all day long. If you have questions, come down and ask the questions. I'm sorry I didn't leave you like ten minutes of questions and answers, but I promise you later today when I do the second session that I will start it out with, hey, what all questions do you have? And at lunch you can ask questions too. That works out. But it doesn't matter if it works out because it's 1047 and no one's stopping that clock. So thank you all for coming this morning. concurrent sessions. They're going to start at 11 o'clock. Um, there are three different options. Um, and if you want to talk more to Todd, you can do so. And he'll also be here in the same room um, for an afternoon workshop. Yes. So. But we have 13 minutes before the next session, so if you do have a question or two, you can hang around and ask me. But for sake of time, you know that you have to go. <laughs>